Ah, hello, dear friends. It's been quite a while since I have recorded a whispered video, so thought I would uh, start again upon discovering this lovely, very retro um, book on the coming of civilization at a local charity shop. It's uh, even got the faded spine, as you can see, running down the back of it there. It's uh, been around the block a little bit. I think it was published in the early 1970s. It's another opportunity for us to explore civilization. And uh, this book covers a broad time span of human history from the emergence of early man to the creation of great civilizations in Mesopotamia, around the Mediterranean Sea, and farther afield in Eastern Asia. It involves the dramatic accounts of the rise and fall of warring nations led by powerful kings and brilliant generals, and queens as well, let's not forget. Also a tremendous breakthroughs in science and technology, art and architecture, and philosophy and religion. But of equal importance, there is the story of how ordinary people lived, worked, and worshipped, and how they were affected by new ideas and inventions. So we have here right away quite an interesting time chart. So no one can say exactly what constitutes a civilization, nor can one say exactly when a civilization emerged or declined. But here the historical pattern of 32 peoples shows the already complex world that had evolved by AD 1600. So we start from 4000 BC to 1600 AD. This chart shows when the world civilizations emerged, flourished, and declined. All of them developed over a long period before reaching their peaks, and each civilization was unique. Some declined and disappeared short, uh, slowly, like the Aegean and the Byzantine. Others, like the Assyrian and the Aztec, ended abruptly following military disasters. Some civilizations owed much to earlier, barely known predecessors. So, for example, the Maya owed much to the Olmecs, and the Babylonians inherited their civilization from the Sumerians. Some flourished again after a long decline, such as the Egyptian, Babylonian, Chinese, and Indian, that all survived foreign domination. Some early civilizations, including the Hebrew, Arab, French, and Japanese, have in different ways continued into present times. The Hebrew civilization was tiny, the Mongol vast, Persia, Han, China, and Rome were roughly comparable. The Inca civilization lasted two generations, the Egyptian over 100. So yes, you can see here the Egypt run, which is this second row. We've got, what, just before 3,000, so around about 3,000 to 30 or something, all the way up until 450-ish AD. No, sorry, 350 BC. Thousands upon thousands of years. An incredible length of civilization. We can see here. Macedonian civilization declined. Begin Greek into Macedonian, the Roman Empire here gradually declining up until the 16, about about 14, uh, 1450. The sudden decline here of the Incas and the Aztecs. I'm guessing because of yes, the Spaniard. Spaniard incursions onto these um, civilizations here. So we start with early man. Our knowledge of the lifestyle and technology of early man has been pieced together by the work of archaeologists and anthropologists. New discoveries are being made all the time, so do bear in mind 
mind this is now this book is over 50 years old which is quite terrifying to think actually when you consider it's in the 70s it's a 50 year old book <laughs> so of course been a huge amount of discoveries and advances in understanding our own history but uh, early I mean I think you can see that in the um, the, um, the semantics that the word chosen early men as opposed to early peoples so between two and three million years ago two types of upright walking men 1470 man and Ethiopian man lived in East Africa and had more advanced brains than those of any other known species they chipped flakes of stones to make sharp cutting edges and the stone age culture that they began dominated the world until a few thousand years ago some think they may have been our direct ancestors, but we have no certain knowledge of who our ancestors were, and we cannot be sure that all present-day people are descended from common ancestors. Several other kinds of men lived nearer our own times. Homo erectus, upright man, used fire and hunted animals over large areas of Africa, Europe and Asia, perhaps over 500,000 years ago. Physically, they probably had the power of speech, but we can never know to what extent they used it. Homo sapiens, wise man, lived in Denmark, Germany and England about 250,000 years ago, had a skull similar to ours in shape. One of several varieties of Homo sapiens, Neanderthal man, dominated Europe 30,000 to 70,000 years ago, between the last two ice ages. About 35,000 years ago, Homo sapiens sapiens, our own subspecies, had firmly established themselves. One of the groups, Cro-Magnon Man, migrated from southeastern Asia into France, Italy and North Africa, where they survived until 10,000 years ago. We don't know whether or not they made it outside their own subspecies or groups, nor did we know why they did not survive. Climatic change, conflict between groups, or changes in the available food supply, may have all contributed to their doom. So the basic necessities of life. Early mankind gathered fruits, nuts, berries and other edible plant products, trapped fish and animals, devised increasingly cunning ways of doing so. They made simple weapons and developed tactics to outwit their prey. And about 400,000 years ago they found, probably by accident, that fire, if controlled, could be used to cook meat another food. Control of fire gave man an even greater advantage over hostile animals. We have here as a reference the Aborigines of um, Australia. The Aborigines of Australia provide an interesting example of Stone Age people. As observed by man in the 1800s, they probably migrated into southeastern Asia into Australia over 30,000 years ago before the sea covered the land bridge between New Guinea to Australia. And when the British landed in Australia in 1788, the Aborigines numbered about 300,000, yet they comprised more than 5,000 tribes speaking 300 different languages. Bones provided an easily workable material. The earliest known Chinese characters are written on skull bones preserved in the National Museum in Taiwan. Boomerangs, slightly L-shaped sticks made by some Aborigines of Australia provided effective weapons in hunting and war. There were three kinds. Returning boomerangs were used in contests of skill for deflecting birds in flight so that they swooped down to be scooped into a net. Really? I didn't know that and non-returning boomerangs when thrown accurately killed or maimed human enemies, animals, reptiles, birds and fish. Ritual boomerangs decorated with secret symbols were used in dance, mime, song, performances and ceremonies. The ancient Egyptians and Hobbite Indians of the North Americas also used boomerangs. Here are some examples of the very tools of Stone Age man. We have the pebble chopper, the primitive pointed hand axe with unrefined zigzag flaking along the edge, a pointed hand, hand axe, a, here we have a flaking tool which carefully trimmed edge. Here we have a knife chopper. Here we have a 
scraping tool is the polished axe of the new stone age and here we have the stone battle axe of the early bronze age so civilization's first vehicles were probably the floating logs they clung to i love the, again this is just so indicative of when the book is written men's first vehicles I didn't realise we all came from men. <laughs> well, probably the floating logs they clung to, to escape being washed away. Later they scooped out logs to make early canoes and controlled them with crude panels. Wooden rollers and levers were used to move heavy stones into position, and large rafts were built to float them downstream. The Sumerians of Mesopotamia used sledges to transport people and materials. With the invention of wheels, animals trained to carry goods could be harnessed to carts. And the concept of family predated mankind. Animals had grouped themselves into families long before they emerged, but human families probably comprised three generations, although grandparents would be fortunate to survive beyond their mid-thirties. Despite enmities and rivalries, Relatives had great incentives to stay together in bands. Large families constituted strong defense units, provided that they did not outstrip away available food supplies. And when a tribe numbered several hundred people, the idea of it as a social group rather than as a number of individuals became difficult to comprehend. To solve this problem, some tribes chose symbols to represent them. For example, one group became the bear tribe, clearly distinguished from the neighbouring crow people. The images of bear and crow would be the totems or emblems of the two tribes. Much later, the Red Indians of North America and the Polynesians in New Zealand erected poles with their totems at the top. And certain natural features within the tribal territory or on the horizon came to be regarded with awe. Natural phenomena such as volcanic eruptions, thunder, lightning, rain, sun, moon, and stars seem to possess overwhelming power in their own right, and aware of their own comparative inferiority, we worship them as super beings or deities, and one deity in particular, the storm god in the storm swept Hittite Empire, became the chief god. Dead or even living, leaders became gods in their own right. Here's a stone monument in the Dolmen de Cacora de Brittany. Dolmen's the term used for a type of prehistoric structure that was built as a burial chamber in the Neolithic period. Many examples across Britain and France. This is the Venus of Willendorf, Austria, one of the earliest known works of art. A limestone figure, 10 centimeters high carved perhaps 25,000 years ago to symbolize fertility. And here is a uh, tomb or a long barrow built around 4,500 years ago at West Kennet, Wiltshire, UK, which held the bodies of 45 or more people buried at different times. The dead, possibly chieftains, were buried with arrowhead speeds and earthen vessels to comfort them in the afterlife. The roof was formed of 50-ton stone slabs. Stonehenge hung up on stones built on Salisbury Plain in the UK about 3,800 years ago it may have been an early observatory or a temple for sun worshippers. Its builders constructed Stonehenge with a precision based on accurate knowledge of the sun's movements. Of course, if anybody here is watching has watched the um, 17 Mysteries of the Ancient World, this has gone into in a lot more detail. So they are obviously applying here their own um, understanding of how it was erected. But since this book has been published, they've uh, they've scientists have, have tested all kinds of different means of how this was actually done. So trade preceded civilization. Barter in salt and gold between people who never spoke or even met was common in Africa until a few hundred years ago. But not all people traded to satisfy their wants. Some turned to robbery or privacy. Privacy or piracy, rather. Tribal law laid down permissible patterns of behaviour with standardised punishment for 
for those judged guilty of breaking it. An early tax collector was the tribal chief who first thought of exacting payment in kind for travellers to drink at his spring or pass through his territory. Inevitably, not all people accepted the rules and people sometimes revolted against their chief or tribal elders. So mankind had learned much, but knowledge was unevenly spread. Here and there, knowledgeable men lived in favourable environments. And about 6,500 years ago, such settlements stood poised with a great leap forward into civilization. Unknown peoples with the new talents began to gather together their strands of knowledge and to persuade their fellows to put learning to practical use. And the Sumerians were first off the mark. So the Sumerians established the first settled civilization based on agriculture and trade. They built the first cities, invented wheeled vehicles, and laid claim to the first usage of a written language. So this map here shows Mesopotamia as it may have been in Sumerian times, when the present day Persian or Arab Gulf probably extended farther north. Akkad is believed to have been on the Euphrates, near to Kish. So about 6,000 years ago, successive waves of people were migrating into the flat coastal clay and marshlands of what is now Iran and southern Iraq. They call themselves the black-headed people and were probably nomadic shepherds. We know them as the Sumerians and the land in which they settled as the land of Sumer. They established the first recognizable civilization with a workable system of government and their other achievements include the invention of wheeled vehicles and use of written language. They developed the scientific practice of agriculture, and on the arts side, evolved a distinctive style of architecture and a complex religion, which is reflected in their literature. So they probably conquered and intermixed with an earlier people who migrated from the Arabian desert by about 3500 BC. They had established several cities, in which included Erek, Kish, Lagash, Lhasa, Nippur, and Ur, which is the best known of the Sumerian cities. They are built on land that is deposited by the life-giving twin rivers, um, the Tigris and Euphrates, which entered what is now called the Persian Gulf as one waterway, the Shad al-Arab. The land between the twin rivers was called Mesopotamia and Sumer lay at its southernmost end. Ur, the ruins of which are now over 160 kilometers inland, may once have stood on the coast. So although the whole of Sumer shared a common culture, the Sumerian city-states, independent cities with their own kings, seldom united and often fought wars against each other. This sometimes resulted in the formation of small empires that rose and fell as the balance of power shifted from one city-state to the next. However, Sumer lasted well over 1,000 years before it fell to a Semite warrior people from the north, the Akkadians. And even then, Sumerian culture continued to dominate the new empire. Many legends around the person of the Akkadian leader Sargon I, who was once cupbearer to the king of Kish, including one story which tells that he was found as a baby floating on the river in a basket made of reeds. That sounds like a certain biblical figure, doesn't it? That's supposed to have happened uh, approximately 1,000 years before an account was written of Moses being found in similar circumstances. Here's some uh, sort of clay brick cities weren't built to last long. Lacking building stone, they had to continually rebuild, and the ruined mounds or tells can still be found in the Mesopotamian desert. Bricks were either sun-dried or kiln-baked. Other civilizations, including Egypt, may have borrowed architectural ideas from Sumer, the world's first known civilization. Here is a plan of the city of Ur, the ziggurat, the wall of Nebuchadnezzar, courtyard of the temple of Nana, site of the early temple of Ningal, houses from the time of Abraham. It's number five. The site of the palace of Ur Namu, the Cypress Gate, and the early cemetery. So quite small and well contained. So Ur was a fairly typical Sumerian city, and the inhabitants believed that it belonged to Nana, the moon god. He lived, they thought, in the northwestern corner of the city, which stood higher than the rest and was surrounded by a wall. 
this sacred area, a city within a city. The citizens of Ur built many temples for Nana, and also a ziggurat, which is a square-sided tower, which we'll learn about in a moment. At the top of which, Nana was supposed to live with his wife Ningal. People came to the sacred area not only to visit the temples, but also to pay their rents and taxes to the god, and to receive justice from him. Although they dealt with officials, the citizens regarded them as mere agents of Nana, and the priest king who ruled over the city-state was called his steward. The ziggurat stood solid like a mountain on the flat plain, so that far outside the safety of the city, farmers and herdsmen could see Nana's abode and take comfort that he was watching over them and protecting them. The oval-shaped inner city of Ur was a maze of narrow streets, alleys, and bazaars, and the outer city, five times as big, covered only five square kilometers, yet housed about 350,000 people, most of whom were reasonably prosperous and traded in locally produced or imported goods. So each house had a shrine dedicated to the family's own special deity who guarded its interests. Wealthy people had statues made of themselves which they stood in the temples to act as their representatives before the gods whom they would pray to and appease while their owners were about going about their daily business. Sumer had many deities and myths. Dumuzi, the god of vegetation, was believed to die in winter and to be reborn each spring. Enlil, whose shrine stood in the city-state of Nippur, supposedly separated heaven from earth. He had many other jobs, and the Sumerians believed that he uh, created lesser gods to help him in his tasks. Enki, a practical god who brought order out of chaos, organized agriculture and engineering. So although the Sumerians believed in an afterlife, their ideas of the next world was not attractive. In it, people sat in darkness, eating dust and clay, clothed in feathers like birds. Interesting. That's, um, a depressing thought. Rich and powerful people took great care to enter the next world in the proper way. When Queen Buabi died over 4,500 years ago, her body was dressed in finery and jewellery and taken to a special burial chamber, accompanied by two personal attendants, musicians, courtiers, soldiers and servants. Oxen and donkeys walked down the ramp, pulling brightly decorated carts, and were guided by their drivers and grooms into position in the tomb, where the whole company took up their proper positions and then drank a drug that made them unconscious. When all was still, workmen killed the animals and walked up the chamber, entombing the living with the dead. Queen Buabi had entered the next world in the style demanded by her rank. That's a lot of devotion terrifying devotion. Up there is a silver vase depicting the goddess Ningal, wife of Nana, and here are objects recovered from the royal cemetery at Ur, including the decorated dagger and the gold beaker. The beaker is from the grave of Queen Buabi, whose burial chamber is the best preserved of all the royal graves. And here is the drawing that shows the ziggurat at Ur as it may have looked, so in the hill less Ur, it loomed like a mountain. Nana, god and supposed owner of the city-state, was believed to live up here. From that vantage point, they watched over and protected everyone from evil. The Sumerians also delivered the, developed the earliest known written language, beginning with their pictographs, and they gradually changed to cuneiform, wedge-shaped writing that could be quickly inscribed on damp clay tablets with a sharp-ended reed, clay and reeds being the two material that Sumer abounded in. Thousands of these tablets still survive. They also made use of cylinder seals for official business documents, which then rolled over a tablet left the impression of a pictograph or cuneiform on the seal. Sumerian literature included the Epic of Gilgamesh, the legendary king of Erech, in which Gilgamesh mourns the death of his friend Enkidu, who had been created by the gods. Determined to find out how to become a mortal, Gilgamesh travels to the Ocean of Death, beyond which he meets Udanavistim, a semi-divine immortal, who tells him how the gods created a great flood to destroy mankind because they were too noisy. <laughs> well, and noisy people can be that irritating, I suppose, even to gods, but one god here warned Udanavistim of the coming disaster and he escaped by building a boat. 
So although the gods were angry at this, he had persuaded them to grant Utnabishnim immortality. Utnabishnim tells Gilgamesh that the gift of immortality lies in a certain plant. Gilgamesh finds this plant only to be robbed of it by a snake, and in despair he realizes that the god will not grant immortality to men, and that all must age and die. So here is a ceremonial helmet belonging to um, King Meskalamdu of Ur and was buried with him, and in a quilting was laced into the helmet through the holes in its rim. Brilliant craftsmanship there with the ear. Here's the Naram Sin of Akkad, which is shown on this steel in uh, Triumph over a Iraqi king. And the grimmer side of the standard of Ur shows the city-state at war. It reads from the bottom row upwards where chariots advance, trampling underfoot enemies. The light infantry armed with axes and spear butcher their naked opponents and copper armored infantry infantry, heavy infantry infantry in cloaks advance ominously, and finally the king, taller than the other fingers, figures, confronts the bound prisoner brought before them for judgment. So the Sumerians may have been the first people to understand the principles of scientific agriculture, the relationship between seed, soil, water, and the annual cycle of the weather. Barley, their chief crop, was used as a form of money, and they also cultivated flax, lentils, peas, wheat, and vetch, which is a kind of bean, and possibly olives, grapes, and other fruits. To improve agriculture, Sumerian engineers constructed dams and canals, which were also used for water transport. Salt from the river fertilized the lands, which yielded two crops a year, and the Sumerians kept sheep and goats and some pigs, animals considered to be unclean and eaten only by the poor. They took a great interest in mathematics, possibly out of the necessity uh, to survey land, and they based on their number systems on units of 60, and passed on to present times the 60-minute hour and the 360-degree circle. Interesting, I didn't know it was Sumerian. Here are the jewels on a model head that will show what is worn by a Sumerian lady. The leaves, flowers, and earrings are of beaten gold, and the necklace is of cornelian pearls and lapis lazuli. This is an ivory gaming board, which has 14 counters, but no one knows how the game was played. They seem to have valued their leisure, for several games and musical instruments have been found. And here's a golden bull's head found buried at Ur, once adorned by a lyre. Experts rebuilt the instrument as it was. Here's an example of a Sumerian uh, seal when rolled across documents left a pictographical cuneiform impression, and they wrote on clay with a sharp reed. So about 1,000 years after civilization began in Sumer, Sargon of Akkad conquered the warring city-states and set up the Akkadian Empire that lasted for about 200 years. Sargon's first triumph was to make himself king of the city of Akkad, after which he added Kish to his domains. In many battles later, he defeated Erech, broke its walls, and took its king in chains to Nippur. His campaigns took him far and wide, from the backward land of Assyria to the north to Lebanon, known as the land of the cedars, as it supplied so much timber, and to the Mediterranean Sea. He also claimed the conquest of Elam, a country to the east. Sargon's main aim in fighting these bloody and exhausting wars seems to have been the sheer glory of conquest, though he was motivated by the need to gain raw materials such as wood, stone and metals, and to expand the foreign trade on favourable terms. He was history's first great empire builder, and his reign lasted for about 56 years, after which he was followed by his grandson, Naram-Sin, who extended the empire. On the death of Naram-Sin, the empire began to decline and break up. Eric rebelled and seized much of the old land of Sumer. The Amorites attacked from the northwest, but the most powerful attack came from the fair skinned barbarian Gaitians, who pushed him from the Sacros Mountains. The Sumerians called them the Mountain Dragons, and by about 2160 BC they ruled much of Mesopotamia. Opposition to the Gaitians came from the city state of Lagash, whose priest king Gudea halted the Gutian advance. Gudea kept his city-state at peace, preferring prosperity to conquest, but after his death, Sumer came under the leadership of the king of Erech, who finally
Mighty drove out the Cadians. The Sumerian and Akkadian territories became increasingly unstable politically, and by 2000 BC the Amorites were taking over the city-states. Despite political and military upheaval, Sumerian civilization did not die. It was absorbed by Babylonia and later by Assyria, and its influence was felt as far afield as Egypt. Which now brings us on to the Egyptians and the majesty of the pyramids at Giza is just one of the many wonders left behind by the Egyptian dynasties. The chance discovery of Tutankhamun's priceless treasures has reawakened our interest in this fascinating era. The Egyptians depended upon the Nile River for life even more than the Sumerians relied upon the twin rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Nile Valley was Egypt, a thin ribbon of fertile land, hemmed in by sandy desert. The Egyptians became master builders, competent agriculturalists and mathematicians, and they established the world's first nation-state. And much of their achievements derived from their obsession of, of life after death. So Hamitic people began farming along the valley and the delta of the Nile about 6,000 years ago. By about 3,100 BC, when they'd established several small estates, King Menes united the south and the north in one long corridor, a kingdom extending about 900 kilometers along the Nile. Memphis, near its delta, became the capital soon after 3,000 BC. Egypt regarded its king or pharaoh as a god-king, not as the representative of a god-like the Sumerian priest kings, but as a god in his own right, and to govern effectively, the pharaohs divided Egypt into gnomes, each under a governor. Surrounded by deserts and seas, Egypt was sheltered from raids and invasions for 1400 years, and its isolated civilization remained almost unchanged for twice that long. Historians have divided Egypt's history between 3100 and 332 BC into 31 royal periods or dynasties. So the best known feature of ancient Egypt is its pyramids, the earlier of which was built the earliest was built for King Zosa of the Third Dynasty by Imhotep, the first architect named in history. This was a step pyramid located at Saqqara near the Nile, south of present day Cairo, and represented the world's first stone monument. Around the Saqqara pyramid, Imhotep built several courts and temples. Although stone was used for royal and official buildings such as the pyramids, ordinary Egyptians lived in simple mud brick houses. The Great Pyramids built during the 4th Dynasty were located at Giza, now a suburb of Cairo, and the two largest were built in the 2500 BCs for King Khufu and his son King Khafre. The mysterious Sphinx built by Khafre is believed to have used his likeness, and they are among man's greatest achievements. Built as tombs for the pharaohs, the massive pyramids washed the energy, wasted the energies of the nation. So to construct Khufu's tomb pyramid, 100,000 slaves labored for 20 years, shaping and moving into position about 2.3 million blocks of stone weighing about 2.5 tons each. The base of the pyramid is large enough to enclose six football fields. It's a true squared within 15 millimeters accuracy, a tribute to Egyptian skill in mathematics and surveying. And below the pharaoh, enforcing his will, were the nobles, priests, and officials. Chief among the officials, the vizier enforced the law and imposed social and economic order. A vast army of conscientious scribes or clerks assisted the officials in controlling agriculture, industry, and trade. So here we have um, leveling the site according to the surveyor's instructions was the first job in building monuments and uh, moving the massive blocks of stone took heavy demands on muscle power. Uh, ramps may have been built around the stone pyramids. In the almost rainless country, agriculture depended upon the volume of the Nile's waters. Nilometers were installed to measure the rise of the river and so enable the signs of the coming harvest to be predicted. 
the scribes then estimated the likely tax yield, and from this sum they allotted funds to various government departments to finance new development projects. Scribes also set up checkpoints on the Nile, which was by far the most important trade route, and searched the boats like modern customs men, extracting taxes for the pharaoh. Apart from stone, Egypt relied heavily upon imported raw materials. Up the Nile from the Mediterranean came timber from Lebanon. Semi-precious stones such as malachite and turquoise came from the Sinai. Copper from Cyprus and tin, iron, gold and wine from Asia Minor and the Levant. Down the Nile from Nubia came amethyst and gold. And from East Africa, animals and animal products. Most Egyptians toiled on the land and they seldom went hungry. And their food was varied, but even those who were not actually slaves were often pressed into forced labour for the pharaoh. Canals, pyramids, palaces, tombs and temples had to be built and maintained. An unknown scribe recorded the grievances of ancient Egypt's peasants, deploring especially the taxes they had to pay. Barley, wheat, fruit and vegetables were staple crops. Dates, figs, leeks, onions, garlic, cucumbers, radishes, beans, lettuces were grown and eaten even by the poor. Wine was produced from the plentiful vineyards and beer made from barley. And as Egyptians increased in prosperity, many peasants' sons became artisans, and contemporary friezes show the work of bakers, brewers, butchers, carpenters, metal workers, as well as many others. And the quest for agricultural efficiency turned Egypt's priests and officials into competent scientists and engineers. They studied mathematics to become accurate surveyors, and correctly interpreted the seasons and the annual growth cycle, and calculated that the year had 365 days. They built dikes and dams and irrigation canals, especially at El Fayum. Got lots of um, images to look at here. We've got a plough team cutting a furrow. The plough came into use in Egypt about 4,500 years ago. And at first it was little more than a two-handed hoe with a shaft at it. It took another 1,000 years before the plough had a metal snare. A share. Handles were then strengthened by the addition of more cross pieces. Speedier ploughing then released men for new trades, and surveyors measure a field with their ropes. Accurate land surveying was regarded as highly important by Egypt's rulers. Here are irrigation canals that flow between plots of agricultured la agri um, cultivated land across the Nile Valley. And here is farming, the chief occupation of the Egyptians, almost entirely carried out along the fertile banks and the delta of the Nile. Many crops are cultivated, including grains, fruit and vegetables. Here's a fella, a Egyptian farmer of present times, ploughing their land with an ox tea, using methods unchanged for thousands of years. About six out of every ten Egyptian workers still till the soil or raise animals. And agriculture produces 30% of the gross national product. A pharaoh looking at a present day field might think, but for the change in dress, he was in his own time. I mean, this was 50 years ago, so he'd understand if that wasn't the case anymore. Here is an image of Egyptian fishermen on the Nile landing a good catch, which cost no fish which cost nothing was eaten gladly by poor people, even though it was sacred. And present day Egyptians search for fish offshore. Using little equipment, they seek free food as the price of their labour, and their ancestors did the same in pharaonic times. Thebes, a royal city and burial ground, which lay nearly 700 kilometres south of the pyramids. Ancient Thebes covered some 16 square kilometres, and on the east bank of the Nile stood the city of the living, including the great temple of Karnak, which began to be built during the 12th dynasty, and was still being added to 1600 years later. The smaller Luxor temple was built around 1400 BC. And across the Nile on the west bank of Thebes, in modern Luxor, lay the city of the dead. Most burial and cemeteries in ancient Europe were made on the west bank in the desert so as not to waste valuable agricultural land and because the Egyptian equivalent of heaven was thought to be in the west with the setting sun. One of the titles of Osiris, um, the god of the dead, was lord of the westerners. At Thebes, nobles had brightly discovered, decorated to tomb chapels cut into the hillside. The burial chamber with the mummy was deep below them, and in the 18th century the pharaohs began to be buried in a remote valley in the Theban hills, now known as the Valley of the Kings. The first pharaoh buried there was Thotmes I in 1512 BC, and most of the pharaohs
Pharaohs and the next two dynasties were also buried there. Each tomb is now numbered and the last one found, number 62, is that of Tutankhamun. Here are um, Egyptian gods. We've got Isis, the wife of Osiris, Ra, the sun god, Anubis, the guide of human souls, Hathor, the sky goddess, Seth, the god of all animals, Thoth, the messenger of the gods, Nephis, the protective goddess, Horus, the sky god, Osiris, the god of the dead, Ta, the god of Memphis, Sobek, the god of crocodiles, and Amon, lord of the two thrones and the two lands. Pharaohs had a uh, choice of the ceremonial crown, the white crown of Upper Egypt, the red crown of Lower Egypt, and the double crown, the or the blue war crown. So most of the royal tombs were robbed of their rich content centuries ago, and several of them stood open in classical times, and the Greek and Roman tourists have left their names and comments scribbled in some of the walls. In the tombs of the nobles, the walls are decorated with colourful and lively scenes of everyday life. Religion and mythology played an important part in Egyptian society, and some of its many deities were believed to control birth and death, while others responsible for various aspects of daily life, surveying, language, numbers, harvesting, and so on. The two supreme gods of Egypt, Ra and Osiris, where the good god Osiris was killed by his twin brother Seth, who cut his body into pieces. Isis, the wife of Osiris, put his body back together again, so the god was resurrected. Osiris, Isis, and their son Horus, a falcon god, formed a trinity at the top of the pantheon, and their chief helpers included Anubis, the jackal-headed god of the dead, Thoth, the ibis-headed scribe, and Hathor, the cow goddess. The role of Anubis was to weigh the heart of each dead person against a feather, symbolizing truth on the scales. Monsters devoured those found to have unjust hearts, whereas good-hearted people were allowed to enter into the afterlife. The traditional religion was disturbed by King Amenophis IV of the 18th dynasty, who changed his name to Akhenaten to symbolize the beginning of a new religion based on the worship of one god only, Adon, the sun. But priests forced his next but one successor, Tutankhamun, to restore the old religion within 20 years. So of course we know all about mummification, which was preserving the, the dead, and the art of mummification reached its height during the 21st and 22nd dynasties. The purpose was to preserve as much of a person's identity after death. The idea of a person disappearing into nothing horrified the Egyptians, who even mummified some animals. The falcon was one of the highest divinities and representations of the idea of God in pictograms. And the Egyptians believed that a man needed his body in the afterlife, so they preserved the dead by the complex procedure of embalming and mummification. Here is Tutankhamun, remarkably undamaged by time and robbers. So the water plant papyrus grew freely in Egypt, providing material for sandals, mats, and sailcloth, but above all, it provided a useful writing material which was similar to paper. A sharpened rush made a pen, and gum and soot were used as ink. Having papyrus instead of clay, the Egyptians had no need to use cuneiform, so instead they developed pictographs into clearer hieroglyphics. So, of course, we're quite familiar with hieroglyphics, which were carved onto the temples and monuments of Re um, Egypt, where they can still be read, but by about AD 500 they'd been forgotten and were regarded only as magical signs through which evil could be communicated. But in the 1820s, Jean Champollion, a Frenchman, deciphered them using the Rosetta Stone. Ancient Egyptian literature includes mythological and historical romances, poems, essays on morality, school texts, political propaganda. A popular work, The Story of the Shipwrecked Sailor, tells of how a sailor became a castaway on an island in the Red Sea and was given shelter by a strange serpent. The tale of two brothers seems to be connected with the myth of Osiris and, S Osiris and Seth, and then the tale of Sanu, a fugitive from Egypt, settles in the Palestine, in Palestine um, among the desert nomads. In old age, he is pardoned, allowed to go home. The kingdom ruled by Menes. 
years, about 3100 BC, comprised Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. To symbolize the unity of the two countries, the pharaohs wore a double crown. The most famous of all the pharaohs is perhaps Ramesses II of the 19th dynasty. The Egyptian dynasties ruled for about 1400 years, after which the Semitic Hyksos people trickled into Egypt from Syria about 1674 BC and eventually seized the royal power. The Hyksos lasted 100 years and then the Egyptians ruled until the Libyans, who were employed as soldiers by Egypt, seized power to form the 22nd dynasty, which began a long series of disastrous invasions, and the Nubians and Ethiopians ruled Egypt as the 25th dynasty. They were followed by the Assyrians, who invaded Egypt and set up the 26th dynasty. They were then defeated by the Persians, who founded the 27th dynasty. The 31st and final Persian dynasty fell to Alexander the Great of Macedon in, the th in 332 BC. But nevertheless, this was not the end of the Egyptian civilization, which lived on under its new conqueror. This necklace represents the scarab god rolling into the ball of the sun into the other world, just as the scarab beetle pushes a ball of dung. This symbolized the renewal of the life and the idea of eternity. And this gilded wood statue of Tutankhamun as a harpooner is one of the many statues symbolizing the king's afterlife. That brings us on to the Indus Valley people, which I'm keen to learn more about. But I think for now, we'll put a pin in it. So I look forward to having you join me for more early civilizations in the next part. But until then, 